You're listening to MedEx, the Medical Extrusion Podcast, presented by U.S. Extruders. Extrude with confidence. Custom extrusion equipment designed for you and your application. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the MedEx Podcast. Today's guest is Martin Forrester, R&D Technical Manager at Aptix. Aptix is a global contract manufacturer focused on medical molding, extrusion, coatings, and device assembly. Before we get started with the technical conversation with Martin, we will be joined by Beth Harrison Mayer, Global VP of Marketing at Aptex, to talk about their recent rebranding efforts. Enjoy. Thanks for joining the podcast. Hi, Steve. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey, I know that uh, you've been spending a lot of time in your rebranding efforts, and here's an opportunity, another opportunity to tell the industry about your rebranding efforts. So let's get right into it and tell us about the new name. Sure, I would love to. So we named the company Aptix because it brings together the aptitude and excellence of more than a dozen companies with a 70 year plus track record, helping customers solve complex manufacturing challenges. And if you go beyond the name and you look at our logo, so the word mark, the actual aptics part, that's a custom font. And you may notice it has unique cutouts and notch details. So you could say it's actually highly engineered uh, in line with the products that we make. And then the logo mark, so that's the X mark, and I'm not sure for those who yep. can see it, but that's the, the mark within uh, the logo. It pulls from the A and the X in our name, but also an apex that you find in A and the X, so the pinnacle, and then the rising arrow representing consistent growth and also action, which is a big part of our culture. Ah, very creative. Thanks for sharing that. If I put my marketing hat on, and I think about rebranding, there are certainly reasons to do it. On the other hand, sometimes you have organizations that have such a great legacy and strong brand name recognition, and they rebrand. And I never really understood that. So in this case, tell me, you know, why did you rebrand? Sure. I think you know, but some of the audience may not, that uh, the core legacy organization, MDI, or Molded Devices, uh, we were acquired by TrueArc Partners. They're a private equity firm focused on transforming and growth for middle market companies just last year. And then almost immediately thereafter, we acquired Global Med, who is a leader in extruded tubing for respiratory anesthesia and smoke evacuation applications. And actually, Martin, who you're about to speak with, has spent a couple of decades at Global Med. But really, these two acquisitions were the start of a vision to build a new kind of manufacturing company. And, you know, we felt that we needed a name and a brand that was as big as the vision. And we also felt it was strategically important to rebrand to be able to bring the vision to life, not just for customers, obviously critical, but also for our team members, because really we were putting things together and charting a new path forward. And this helps represent that. And then the name Aptics, we felt was uh, a very bold statement about where we want to go, but at the same time, it does honor uh, the history of our legacy company. So it brings the two together and it lets us rally around our future. Okay, excellent. During the intro, you mentioned a 70 year history, which is impressive. Can you expand on that history a little bit? Sure. So uh, our history starts with molding. Uh, injection molding, dip molding, and blow molding. And it uh, begins in 1949 when Sites was founded. Sites is one of the legacy companies, a leader in complex injection molding, and in particular areas like precision gears that drive robotic applications, drug delivery. Uh, and then Molded Devices was founded about 60 years ago. And they, that start was in dip molding, and we're a leader in dip molding, and then have had many acquisitions to cement that leadership position along the way. And then uh, via Global Med, as well as Metafab and Bates, uh, those three companies, we extrude millions of feet of tubing every year. And then in the coatings area, for more than two decades via Diptek Systems, we have been a leader there in application and in particular in the design and manufacture of the equipment to apply the coatings and uh, particularly highly automated equipment. So as you can see, it's a very rich history. And 
you know, it's really driven by the people like anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we like to talk about engineering expertise being the heartbeat of the company. And I know when you talk to Martin here in a few minutes, that's something that will really come through loud and clear. Okay. Having been involved in, in some rebranding efforts myself, I know it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of time <laughs> to get everybody together to agree on all these things. If you don't mind, share with us that experience. Sure. You're right. It's a lot of work, but it is also so much fun and really exciting. And, you know, like anything, it takes a process. Mm -hmm. And for us, we used a process called systems thinking. So it really brings together our strategy, it, the input of a lot of different stakeholders, and then what's the story you want to tell. And on top of that, we uh, built out the roadmap to then bring it to life. But with the, with stakeholders, we started with interviews, and that was with team members from a range of areas in the company, you know, from operators up to the CEO. And of course, we talked to a lot of customers. And then with all those inputs, our overall strategy, we then, you know, continued to move through the process. Naming was one part of it. And I tell you, when we got to names, we looked at a lot, and I don't mean a mm -hmm. handful, we looked at hundreds of names. <laughs> but um, very happy with where we netted out and we have gotten a lot of positive feedback as well. Um, but it's important to know that a brand is so much more than a name or a logo. Mm -hmm. What I like to say is that a brand is a promise. It's a promise of what we will deliver to our customers, to our team members and to other stakeholders. And a good brand is a promise kept. And, you know, so it's important that you truly bring your brand to life. So one part of the process, we also reimagined our vision, mission, and values. And as you know, you know, values inform how you act every day. It really drives the culture and culture is the key to everything. And, you know, with those values and the way we're moving forward, it's really um, put a laser focus on what we want to do. And, you know, that's, uh, acting with um, speed, a commitment to quality, and really a focus on straight talk, because we know how much our customers' products matter. And you know, we're all about ensuring that they can get more life impacting uh, innovations to people who need them. And we really have been able to rally around that. And that's our driving point as we move forward. Excellent. Speaking of moving forward, what, what does the future hold? Yeah, these are super exciting times for Aptics. We are uh, very financially strong and we're well capitalized and we're investing in infrastructure in technologies, capabilities, both organically, but also through acquisition. Just hyper-focused on meeting the needs of our customers and supporting their growth. So um, we like to say for our customers that your products are our purpose. And, you know, we really mean that when we say it and we are all about making it happen. Excellent. Hey, thank you so much, Beth, for, for joining us and, and telling us about this story. It's a great story. It's a great logo. It's a great brand. So I wish you all the best. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks okay. again for having me. You're welcome. Hey, Martin, thanks for carving out some time to join us on the MedX podcast today. Thanks for uh, having me, Steve. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. So we're going to talk about some interesting um, hose technology that Aptix is involved with and that you personally, in some cases, uh, were part of a team that developed. Let's get right into it and talk about the embedded wire hose. I know that for, for delivering gas to a patient, it's sometimes desirable to have water vapor within the, the line to reduce the, the potential for the patient to have dry a respiratory system. And so when the water vapor is added to that system, one of the challenges is condensation, right? That can build up and I believe maybe kind of uh, form like a P-trap on a faucet sink and restrict the flow to the patient. Talk to us a little bit about this, how you solved that particular challenge and know that you were part of a team that developed a solution and even a, a patent on this process. Sure. Yeah. The process you're discussing, we call it in the industry, uh, rain out. So essentially what happens is we're trying to deliver humidified air to the patient to reduce the trauma that the patient is under when they're, when they're, you know, undergoing either surgery or long-term ventilation as a result of, of massive trauma. Um, 
what happens is, is that nice warm humid air passes through the tube on the way to the patient and that tube is in a, a cooler environment and the moisture starts to condense and collect inside the tube. Um, what we've done is we've created a, a product where it keeps the airway heated for the, the path to the patient. And what that does is that prevents or eliminates condensation within the tube during the delivery of the, uh, the humidified air to the patient. Um, so our team here, we worked very diligently to, to kind of understand how that is affected. And then essentially we, um, we designed a tube that would create the right amount of insulation to retain the, the heat inside the tube, but also with embedded wires that emit enough energy or electrical energy to create heat to maintain that, that, um, that heat throughout the, the length of the, the hose to the patient. Can, can you also monitor the temperature of that heat or control it within the so, hose? So some of the products that we've, um, we've uh, created here, we have uh, a multitude of wires embedded within the helix. So some, some customers like to have an integrated sensor built right into the, into the circuit so that uh, you're monitoring the temperature. And typically the temperature is monitored right at the, um, the patient interface so that mm -hmm. you know that that's the temperature of the air that is um, reaching the the patient others uh tend to have um a, a temperature probe that can be inserted and reused over time so uh, for different applications uh, the temperature sensors are expensive so they can basically remove the temperature sensor re-sterilize it and reuse it on another circuit so it makes the uh you know the circuits are disposable they're single use only Mm -hmm. It helps just to reduce the cost um, for the end user. Okay. Very interesting technology. Recently, I had Damien Carr from Idea MedTech out of Ireland on the podcast. I'm sure you listened to it, Martin. <laughs> yep, I did. <laughs> oh, good. And, and you know, we, I asked him to talk about kind of next generation, minimally invasive catheter design. And he spent a lot of time talking about patient focus and for instance, you know, radial access versus femoral access, less trauma on the patient, less time in the hospital, different modalities for navigation, visualization to avoid radiation exposure to medical staff and the patient. Along those lines, I know that you have been involved with the development or manufacturing of this uh, smoke evacuation systems or tubing related to smoke evacuation for certain electrosurgical applications, lasers, cauterizing, uh, the burning of soft tissue, and that smoke needs to be evacuated from the operating room, I, I believe. Tell us a little bit about that application and what you've done in that area. Sure. There's, um, there's a, a, a procedure uh, where they actually use electric cautery pencils to perform surgery. So as they're using this pencil as a scalpel and cutting, it's not only cutting, but it's also cauterizing any of the uh, the wounds that are created by it so that we're not having a, a major loss of blood or blood interfering with the procedure. The problem is with the electric cautery pencils is there's a, a huge plume of smoke as they, they burn and cauterize at the same time. So that smoke needs to be evacuated from the theater because it's not healthy for, you know, the, the staff, the clinical staff to be inhaling that um, much like any secondhand smoke. So what they've done is they've actually applied a, a vacuum hose to the uh, electric cautery pencil. And what it does is it evacuates the plume of smoke at the, at the uh, source. And so um, there are a variety of different uh, methods that use, but most of them are, you know, they evacuate the smoke and then what they do is they filter it so that it's not entering, re-entering the, uh, mm -hmm. the operating theater. Um, a lot of times these, you know, neurosurgeons or surgeons that are using these, uh, these electric cautery pencils, they, you know, are doing very delicate work and much like an artist with a paintbrush or a, a tool. And so the flexibility of this smoke evacuation hose is, is very critical for them to be able to manipulate their wrists and, and, you know, be very, um, use their dexterity to, to perform their procedures. So we've actually, uh, created some products here where we've been able to enhance the properties of the tubes in a, 
short region of the product that allows for a greater level of flexibility. Um, so there's not as much stress on the end user. Huh. More ergonomic solution. More ergonomic solution. And what we've done is we've actually automated that so that it's part of our manufacturing process. So, you know, there's no additional cost to have that, uh, that, that procedure done at this place because it's, uh, it's performed in line or as the process, as part of the process. Okay. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. In medical applications, medical tubing, one of the components that's very popular is taper or bump tubing, right? Correct. For a minimally invasive application, you might taper down the distal end for more flexibility, kind of like what we just talked about. In an outside of the body application, you might have you know, different diameters for connections to equipment. I understand that you're involved with a new development, a conical hose or a tapered hose that's, you know, has the helically reinforced ribs on it. What can you share about this technology and a little bit about the application as well? Yeah. So this is something, um, you know, I've not seen any other, uh, supplier produce this product, but we build, we're in a good position where we're able to manufacture all of the equipment that we produce our products with. And as part of that uh, development with our, our team here, we were able to actually um, create our equipment or modify our equipment to uh, adjust on the fly. And um, we've automated this process so that essentially what happens is, you know, we can make a tube with a large bore at one end and then gradually taper that product down to a small bore at the opposing end. Um, this might be handy for someone, say, for a, a sleep apnea application where you want a light, small hose at one end to, to you know, attach to the patient so there's, there's very little disruption, and a large diameter hose at the opposing end to connect to the machine. Um, it could be the opposing way as well. So uh, hmm. the nice thing is, is that with the uh, technology that we've created, we're able to, you know, control the rate of uh, transition so we can make a very long taper over a long uh, stretch of hose, or we can make it a fairly abrupt uh, taper so that it goes from a large diameter to a small diameter in a short span of space. Interesting. W what kind of ranges uh, can you transition from one OD on one end to the other end on the OD? So this technology is fairly new. Um, we haven't really fully uh, investigated the full scope of, of range. But currently, right now, we're doing a product that runs from a 10 millimeter diameter up to a 50 millimeter diameter. Um, we're even looking at now going from uh, a 10 millimeter up to a 22 millimeter diameter as well. So it's it's fairly extensive. Okay, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, you're welcome. When I look at Martin, one of these breathing circuits, you know, we have the helically reinforced hose, a, a straight connector on one end. And then uh, it looks like a Y connector with maybe a, an electrical input. And I know these are high volume, right? These are high volume products. That's correct. For, for the assembly of, of a circuit like this with the hose, the connections, is this a, a manual process where you're uh, joining the connectors? Is it semi-automated or is it like fully automated? What can you share about automation for something like this? Sure. In the past, we used to, uh, you know, we've made heated wire circuits for, for many years. Um, those types of circuits we used to manually produce and it's very labor intensive. Um, it, it takes a lot of, you know, dexterity to terminate those, they're very small wires in there. Um, and we found that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, labor and a lot of talent. You need a, a talented staff to, to be able to do this. Uh, our most recent development, we've actually worked on taking that raw hose. So it's, it's extruded. And what we do is that raw tube is now fed to an automation cell where it strips out a section of that helix away from the tube. It then removes the helix from the wires, exposing the wires at both ends. And then what we do is we actually position those wires, automatically terminate them to the terminations. And we end up with a fully terminated hose at the end of that process uh, with electrical connections on either end. Hmm. Um, We've worked very closely uh, with an automation firm. It, uh, 
it was a, a fairly long and painful development, but in the end, we we're able to uh, to do this, and um, it's it's we've got a very high level of repeatability by going to an automated process, and that was another issue that we were dealing with with the um, the hand assembly, where repeatability is just not where it should be. Mm-hmm. So, and this is a, you know these are products that are saving people's lives. Uh, we can't have something that uh, is you know substandard. Yeah. So that was a, a big drive to, for us to to focus on the automation for this product. So you've you've seen a, a pretty dramatic increase in yields going from a manual to a, an automated process. Dramatic increase in yields and dramatic increase in repeatability. Mm. So you know, being able to make the same part identical every time. Yep. So you know, a, a robot doesn't need to take a break. It doesn't need to, you know, and um, you know our. our our thought here was not to replace people, but to improve the process. Yeah, and so it's it's been a very uh, successful venture so far. Yeah, very interesting, excellent. Yeah. Hey, Martin, uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. This has been a real great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Steve. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to MedEx, the Medical Extrusion Podcast, presented by U.S. Extruders. Please subscribe to make sure you're getting the latest episodes. For video episodes, go to us-extruders.com forward slash podcasts. All links are available in the show notes.